it is a really great pleasure um, for me personally and for, for the craft teaching program to welcome Diane Moore of Harvard Divinity School to, to join us today. Uh, Professor Moore is director of um, the Religious Literacy Project at Harvard, as well as a senior lecturer in Religious Studies and Education and a senior fellow at the Center for the Study of World Religions. Her work on religious studies and secondary education is internationally acclaimed. Um, she has chaired the American Academy of Religion Task Force on, on religion in schools and serves on a U.S. State Department Task Force. I, actually, I'm not sure if this is up to date. No. <laughs> Sir, honor me, the U.S. State Department. And, and it, January 21st. So. Uh, yes, indeed. <laughs> Served on a U.S. State Department task force um, to enhance training about religion for foreign service and other State Department employees. Um, she's recipient of multiple awards for teaching excellence and the promotion of public religious understanding. Please join me in welcoming Diane Moore. So thank you for the invitation. I'm a piece of master behind the scenes. It takes a lot of work to all the details, so I want to thank you, especially Aaron. Lovely. Um, and I, I love these opportunities to talk about teaching, so it's a real honor for me, and I look forward to our conversation. So let me tell you a little bit more about me um, to help shape the, the, the conversation I'd like to have, have us have together. Um, so I also, aside from the work I've been doing at Harvard, I didn't have the incredible privilege of actually being a secondary school teacher uh, at Phillips Academy for um, 20 years. I went to, while I was writing my dissertation, I went for a sabbatical leave replacement for one year and in the same for 20 years because I found that age group to be able to talk with and teach with them around fundamental questions of being, which is what we get to do in the philosophy, uh, to be phenomenally set. So um, it's the combination of the fact that they are so coming up into their own self-identity at a really critical time, and then also the fact that um, they don't like, put up with any bull. You know, they, it's like you, if you're not authentic, if you're not honest with them, they diss you like within seconds. And I think there's something refreshing about that. And it really, I think, calls the best, calls out the best of us in relationship to teaching. And I have that experience to thank for any insights that I bring to questions around teaching broadly, uh, and specifically that, that uh, age group. But, but I think much of what I've learned from that age group I think is relevant in everything I do. And so I currently teach um, pretty, it's almost exclusively I teach graduate students, although I do occasionally teach undergraduates, and I frankly miss um, teaching secondary students. And for, for several years I was teaching both, I was both at back, uh, both, great, don't, don't do this, you might, you might find yourself in a situation where you do it, but I was full-time at Harvard and full-time at Phillips Academy at the same time, which is not, not healthy. Yeah. Except it was both, they were both really powerful um, experiences. So, so here's what here's my plan, but we can adopt it if it doesn't feel like it'll be useful for you. And I do want to, if you wouldn't mind in a moment, I'm going to go around and ask you just to tell me who you are, so I know who you are and get a sense of your interests, your backgrounds, and your own your own area of, um, of study. What I'd like to do is talk to you broadly about the challenges that we're currently facing in. Um, in public life now, in the U.S. especially. I think um, what's happening in relation to uh, the um, rise and the election of President Trump is not, um, it's somewhat unprecedented, but it's also not in itself the biggest concern. I was concerned, and, and I suspect many of you were, uh, in terms of the tenor of the election itself, no matter uh, what the results ended up being. I think it's a really critical and important time for, for any of us who are in the academy but I think those of us who are in the academy who are anyway related to the academic study of religion, I think this is a really crucial time for us to rise up and be public intellectuals. I, think, I, I can't emphasize it enough. So some of what I'm going to be talking about is going to be that. It's going to be about the nature of what it means to be a spokesperson uh, around the critical nature of religious literacy at a time and in the context of a background backdrop, not just of the political situation, but the backdrop 
of a lack of, of, of just the fundamental misunderstanding of religion, which I know is not news to any of you. So, the, so it's a really interesting question. It's not just what do you say, how do you teach, but it's how do you anticipate how people are going to hear what it is that you're talking about. And more fundamentally, and I'm going to ask this, ask you to consider this in a moment. Um, we also, I think, it's really going to be important to identify and name for yourselves, for ourselves. Uh, what is the purpose of teaching itself? What is, what, are, what, are, what gives justification aside from content delivery? And I suspect all of us love our content, right? That's why we're here. Um, there's something that we just get really animated about the nature of what we have the privilege of studying. But I think the stakes are too high for us to only live in being excited about the content we teach. Because I think now it's also about helping to translate not just content, but a way to understand religion. And then a way to understand religion that we have to be able to be persuasive about why people should care. Like it's not just about learning content. So that really brings me back to a deeper and more fundamental question about why do we teach? And that's a question I used to, the reason I was both at Phillips Academy full time and also at Harvard full time, I had the privilege for 10 years, the last 10 years actually, of a 35 year program where we had a, literally a mini ed school program at the Divinity School. So our master's students could get licensed to teach in public schools in middle and secondary levels um, in, in all the disciplines except for maths. So it was the sciences, the humanities, and the social sciences in all languages. And we, we were uh, partnering with the Department of Education, and we were like a, we were like an ed school master's program. But we had the privilege of our students graduating with an academic degree, as well as a licensure to teach, and they also had the expertise to, to teach about the ways religion are integrated into those disciplines. So that's the, that was my incredible privilege. And then in 2008, the program got cut because um, of the recession. So the Religious Liturgy Project is a successor to that program, essentially. And we've ex I've expanded it. We've expanded it now to look at other professions, too. Because what we've learned about what does it mean to work with teachers to translate um, complicated ideas to a general audience, which is what secondary, middle and secondary school teachers have to do is really the same set of skills of what it means to um, help translate the complicated ideas of religion to professions and to a general public that also are a general audience and have certain assumptions about religion that are problematic. So, so it's that context that I'm, that I'm going to be speaking to you and I'm, I'm going to look at and offer that in ways that I hope will be useful uh, frameworks for how to think about religion, but then also understandings about what is at stake for us in this. Um, and so I hope I hope this will I hope this will all be, be useful to you. And again, to the extent that this turns out to be the directions I'm gonna go are not that useful, there's so many things we can do here. So I would love to, to hear that. <laughs> so I'll 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 leave the room and see if this is if, if, or, if this is helpful. And um, and then otherwise we would really love to entertain if there are more specific things you'd rather I focus on. Uh, I'm happy to do that, but I will, I will certainly give you a basic overview. I know that there were some suggestions for you to read some things ahead of time. How many of you had a chance? It's really okay if you didn't, but how many of you had a chance to read that? Okay, about half of you, I thought so. And so I will review that quickly uh, and give you an outline, so uh, I won't um, do it in too much detail for those who did read it, but it will be good for those who didn't have a chance to. Great. Uh, this is fabulous. I'm so glad to have a mix of both masters and doctoral students. That's great. Um, and let me, uh, I do remember, so let me jump in here. Uh, so, so the public, this use, use of the internet, another uh, project that I've involved in and actually surprised myself. I decided to run um, a MOOC, a massive open online course, um, at, through Harvard X. And I started it because I hate MOOCs. <laughs> and I thought, I better know what I'm talking about if I hate them so much. Uh, I better actually know what I'm saying and, and see if my anxieties about them are true. Um, and I have really turned the corner on it. I'm really excited about this platform. I have concerns about how it's going to be used. So that's another, there is a moral and ethical set of questions about, about the, how institutions will use moves coming out of places like the University of Chicago or Harvard or Stanford. But, um, but the actual platform itself, we uh, 
I organized a group of colleagues and we taught a, a, a course called um, World Religions Through Their Scriptures. And it's six modules. Um, the part of the module, the method that we're, you know, we practice in that module you're going to learn today, and that's what keeps the consistency throughout. And we flipped it so it's not a lecture based, but it's a discussion based um, on a massive open online platform we had over. Um, 140,000 people have participated in this and from 183 countries. And, I'm, uh, and I'll, I can talk more about that if you're interested, but I'm, I'm really excited about it and I think it's an important arena that especially you all uh, can really uh, learn about and, and I think utilize and help shape. The other thing I want to say is that you all are, I think we're at a really important cusp. The jokes about jobs are not, I know they're real because there are fewer and fewer jobs in, in all, all the communities, um, and the religion certainly not community to that. But there are many, many opportunities for cross-disciplinary, creative ways to think about how do you use the incredible, important, and detailed and fine scholarship that you come through your work as master students or as doctoral students to do this public translation. Uh, at all number of levels, and we need people to, to, to forge new paths. We really do, and I think there's there's a right arena for that now. Um, not just in things like museum studies, although absolutely kind of outside of the academy itself, but um, but but there will be more opportunities. And I'll just I just want to say that to encourage you to be creative and and, and uh, somewhat bold, if you will, about um, imagining what. What is your, your ideal situation? And how can you maybe construct something that's that's akin to that, even if the actual job arena that you imagine yourself going into isn't necessarily going to be readily available to you? So um, that's what we're talking about with our both doctoral and our master students, because we're confronting the issue at the Divinity School about the fact that we need to have the moral responsibility of what it means to educate people for jobs that aren't there. So we, we need to be thoughtful about that. So just to, to leave that on. Um, Okay, so here's my thought. This is what I want. This is my plan for, for our for our um, time, the rest of our time here. Um, I would. I have three case studies. They're very simple and they're somewhat and they're real. They're at the secondary level that I'd like you to just uh, divide up into groups and just stay in your seats. I'm going to just ask you know the four of you to do the first one, and let's have the three of you on the corner do the second, and the three of you. Uh, two of you there do the third and then, no, sorry, there's five of you. Sorry, I'm only five, I usually, um, so yeah, if you move over, oh, you have to leave? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, okay. Uh, I hope it's not the <laughs> Oh, no, um, so let's have the four of you then work. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but they are going to be, um, they're, they're not really highly dramatic, although look, they have some drama to them. I think they, touch on three arenas that have to do not only with secondary teaching and secondary issues around religion, but they have to do with larger questions about a lack of understanding about religion and what it means for us to, to understand these questions. Great. Right. Okay, we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on this, but I do want to go around to each one of the case studies and have you all say a little what, like what you decided and how you got there, and then we'll open it up for each of the case studies just so everybody gets a chance to hear all three of them. But again, I don't want to belabor this too much, but what did you all uh, decide here? So here's the case study up there. We don't, we don't, uh, uh, I'll read it. A local school board was approached by two American Hindu-based groups, the Vedic Foundation and the American Hindu Education Foundation, who complained that the coverage of the Indian and middle and secondary school textbooks was biased against uh, Hinduism. Points of contention include the representation of the caste system, the Indo-Aryan migration theory, and the status of women in Indian society. How should the school board respond and why? What did you all? Decide. And when you speak, speak to the whole group. Just and if, and if I go like that, it means speak to everybody. It doesn't mean, boy, you are crazy. <laughs> <laughs> You're probably right. Okay. 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 Well, you know, first of all, we um, we talked about that it has to be taken seriously. That uh, the response um, has to uh, has to be measured and uh, studied, I guess. Uh, again, if you need to add something, please do. Um, it's also important to for the board to uh, 
to ask why. You said, you know, how does, should they respond? But uh, it's important to get, let, you know, get the call and out of the table and what's the, where is the bias or against what standard, what's the criteria, all that stuff. Uh, or you should have a way approach. Uh, but you know, so we also talked about what responsibility does the school board have to the community at large, uh, and, and do they have to be, uh, uh, who, who, do you, who do they answer to, and what does that entail? Um, uh, we also talked about um, you know, this, the status of these two groups, or you know, they are claiming Hinduism um, as their own, so that, that would mean uh, uh, you know, the research that we make to you know, who the Vedic Foundation is and the Education Foundation of American Hindus under you know, very ominous term uh, titles. Uh, and what, what, you know, what authority these people have to claim on the Hinduism is X or Y to, to the school board. Um, what else did we talk about? Uh, the questions didn't seem overtly religious. Uh, the actual points of contention, and that we all know that religion and culture and society are kind of angled and intertwined and all that stuff. Uh, but it would seem very good reductive to you know, religions X or religions Y. Um, so I don't know if you have anything else. Um, no, I mean, one of the things we said is that <clears throat> the first uh, question you have to ask is how, what, maybe you sort of said is it, what, to whom is the school board responsible and to whom is the curriculum and uh, et cetera responsible and then and, and what's your relationship to the community at large and that probably would determine all the other things that follow and so if you think it's not your job to if I mean, this is the language one that offered it's not our job to pander to individual groups it's the job of uh, you know it's our job to teach children or whatever you know or if your notion is you know all we're sort of our role is inclusion across the entire community and so blah 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 um, that I think it probably follow up in that. Good, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, anyone else want to jump in on this? Comments or anything else to add? Yeah. I was just interested. I just quickly looked up the, the Vedic Foundation of the American Hindu Education Foundation, and they're both very different. One of them is reestablishing the greatness of Hinduism. The other one is actually about social justice. It's about bringing Hinduism back into California textbooks. So. Just something to think about is who are you actually talking to? Do you want to ask why you thought the, the term American Hindu is an ominous thing? <laughs> I was curious, really. No, it, it, it seemed very, I think we thought that it would seem very, uh, very uh, general uh, and uh, you know, trying to appropriate these terms uh, mm -hmm. okay. in a very general way. I mean, it's hard to group every single American Hindu mm -hmm. among these people who take a lot of education in one single foundation. So. Right. So let me tell you what happened. These are all real case studies, by the way. So uh, let me tell you what happened. And some of you may remember this, or may, maybe you weren't paying attention. So uh, in the early 2000s, this was happening in California. Um, and California, anything that happens in education in public schools related to either California or Texas is big news because they uh, drive education policy because they have such a big market for textbooks, and so textbook companies uh, pay attention to what they do and say in terms of their standards for, for responsible education. Um, so what the school board did, didn't know better because they didn't know anything about Hinduism, uh, and didn't know anything about these groups, uh, took the uh, lead from one of the groups who suggested a scholar to review their 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 hopes about what we should be changed. And a scholar, uh, there was a paid consultant a scholar reviewed it and said, yeah, this these groups are all right, these all things should be changed. And then um, other South Asian scholars um, got wind of this and said, holy cow, what's going on? So then there was an organiz organization through the American Academy of Religion to counteract this because it turns out that the Hindu scholar was actually a member of the Vedic Foundation. Uh, and this, both of these groups were promoting what is now pretty common in both India and here in the United States, a Hindu nationalist move, move to challenge the legitimacy of especially the, um, the area migration theory, which is a huge, it, it's, it's akin to uh, evolutionary theory for people who uh, want to promote intelligent design for scientists. Scholars are 98% in agreement about the credibility of the Aryan 
migration theory. Uh, but Hindu nationalists sort of really wanted to challenge that because it, because it challenges the um, indigenous nature of uh, of culture that, that they're eager to promote. So this was reversed, but it was a really touch and go issue because again, school board is responsible for for um, for adopting textbooks and can make policy. The policy has to also be legal. Uh, and so this would have been a violation of the First Amendment and a scholarly violation in relationship to the fact that this would not be the academic study of religion that would be promoted here. It was really promoting a particular in, uh, religious understanding of the, of the, of the tradition. So this was, this was a really wake-up wake up call. And again, I didn't want to use the example of the intelligent design one because a lot of people say, oh, that's pretty obvious. We need to teach evolution science. But this is a similar, similar kind of question. Good, nicely done. Thank you. Okay, second uh, case study. Uh, in several school districts around the country, in the Tennessee, Colorado, Kentucky, Iowa, there are many others. Christian parents have lodged complaints about how Islam is taught to their middle and secondary school age children. A common target is the approach that focuses on beliefs and ritual practices that parents claim represents a bias and overly positive view of Islam, especially in contrast to what is being represented in daily news stories. School boards are being pressured to remove these units from the curriculum. What did you think school boards should do? Um, so, uh, like the first group, there was that first question of, you know, who's the school board accountable to? Decisions like that. Uh, we kind of want to say, but what should the school boards do? Question: If you didn't have that sort of accountability structure, they should just keep doing it. Just keep teaching as you're teaching. No one's going to. But if you actually are elected for like two-year terms, three-year terms, um, you know, what are the things you, we would just start imagining different like ways to uh, uh, you know, placate the population. Uh, 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 one idea we had was to uh, add another unit on the daily news stories, uh, like communication or literature course, where they'd be critically evaluated. Tell parents, hey, look, that, that, we're talking about that too. Kind of. um, uh, do, we have, do we have a few other? Uh, yeah, that was actually the only. That's the only. Only idea we have to think about. Um, I think the, the basis, yeah, basis for thinking in that way was to say if the, if the concern here is bias, um, recognizing that that may be a dog whistle for something else. But if the concern is bias in the presentation of Islam, then is there room for more? Is there room for not not a teach the controversy kind of? Attitude of just saying, well, we're just going to look at both sides, but actually, let's take seriously how Islam is being portrayed in the media that the parents are watching that are worried about, and bring that into class and make that part of the part of the education. Okay. Okay. That's the question. I mean, what's so wrong with presenting rituals of a faith practice? Like, I, I, like, I, I, I hear what's going on, but it's like if ritual is part of a, a group faith, I don't see how it's problematic. I think the idea is the cause. It's like it's how it's perceived as being positive. Mm -hmm. it sounds like it's to me, so it seems like there's a thing. I'm going to throw that out there. Yeah, no, that's a good, so that's the, that being that the central question. Okay. Uh, and unless anyone has anything else they want to say, I'll talk about the resolution of this one, which is not actually resolved, to be honest. So your questions are good ones. In most of um, middle and secondary schools still, unfortunately, and this will be important, so you'll get, this is, this is my own uh, approach that's going to go against this, too. So there's still a uh, phenomenological approach to teaching about these traditions, ahistorical and phenomenological. Literally, there's a, I, I call it the centerfold in the world history textbook because there's a chart in every single world history textbook that will be the religion unit, and it's like three pages, and it shows a chart, colorful chart, of all the five of the five major religious traditions, like founder, member of adherence, book. I mean, all these assumptions are problematic, I'm sure you can understand. Uh, and beliefs and practices, and ritual practices. So the motivations of these people were either both out of ignorance and also out of a concerted effort, organized effort on the part of conservative groups who are in networks to disrupt these kinds of um, opportunities. So this is both in innocent and somewhat nefarious. Um, but they're right. 
the teachers, the, the parents are right because when you teach a phenomenological view of the tradition, you are teaching only a positive dimension of it, um, and it's problematic intellectually. Now, all the other religions are not that way too, but that's not getting targeted. So you've got this really incredibly important and very volatile and very complicated situation when you come when this comes to the forefront, and you don't want to encourage the motivation behind it, at the same time you recognize that there are important truths to it in relationship to the problematic ways we probably teach about religion. This is why we need help. this is why we need teachers, this is why we need people like you as citizens to be able to be part of these kind of conversations who will have more nuanced understanding of religion to step in and help address this. Yeah. I would ask what's the problem with teaching it positively? I mean, if it's not biased, yeah. let the people like take the negative point of view in their own way. <laughs> I, will, I will talk to you about why, why I think it's a problem, but and, that, and you can push back, but that'll be the method I'm about ready to introduce you to. Yeah. Uh, for, and I, I don't want to say it's a problem to teach positive. Of course we should be teaching positive. Uh, but, but we can't only teach positive. That's the, that's the key. Okay, so we've got two, the two examples. This one was about um, a failure to recognize the distinction between a, a devotional assertion about a particular religion and the study of diverse devotional assertions, which is what should happen in uh, public context in the academic study of religion. This one is about um, what happens when our, even what is considered intellectually sound. I mean, these are textbooks that are adopt adopted. They don't violate the First Amendment but they're intellectually problematic and can lead to this sort of true but also problematic uh, set of assertions. So it's about the quality of, the, of what we're teaching. Yes? I was just going to ask, what is considered an overly positive view? Because I have family members who would say that anything about Islam that isn't necessarily negative is overly positive. Is overly positive. So that's, it sounds like that was, that's, that's the kind of sense that, that I got. That's, that's what they're talking about. I mean, so they'll learn the, four, the five pillars, and, and they'll learn that Islam equals is, it, it means um, surrender, or and, or and Islam is a religion of peace. Those are all very powerful, very real for the vast majority of adherents to these traditions. So that's not it's not wrong. It's just not total. And you're right. They 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 believe it's overly positive because they feel like it's not true to what's really true about Islam, which is, of course, that Islam is a religion of terror and violence, which is their belief. So the question is, how do you complicate that? How do we complicate that? And that's what, that's what we're going to be talking about. So you're right, to name what's the heart of that, and that's why I wanted to counter this to say, the intention on some of the parents' parts was just truly somewhat innocent, but the intention on others is that they're organized through these networks of uh, community, communities that are challenging the legitimacy of anything having to do with Islam that isn't about terror. Okay, finally, last case study. A small semi rural town uh, includes Good Friday and the Jewish High Holidays, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, and the school holiday calendar. All are official days off for staff and students. The estimated population of Christians in the town is 65%, and the Jewish population of the town is estimated at roughly 2%. The percentage of, quote, other religions is estimated to be less than 1% combined. A member of the school board moved to strike all religious holidays, quote, unquote, from the school calendar, citing the following reason. If we can't honor all religious holidays, we shouldn't honor any of them. Uh, and it's within the power of the school board to make this decision. And what should they do? When did you decide? We didn't decide. <laughs> what we, did, we talked about both sides of the issue and okay. said, we really can see both sides. Uh, but we talked also about uh, values similar to what these other two groups have brought up. Of, we didn't put it in terms of like what the school board's job is to do, although I think that's another way to put it. But to say, well, if you're going to think about what, do we, what are our values and how are we going to put those values in action, um, that's, that's what this is really about. And we're going to say we value, um, you know, a uh, situation where we go with the vote, vote the majority, we go with democracy, then perhaps then there is room to say, uh, to make sense for some of those holidays to be um, taken off and others not. And on the other hand, if you're going to say your value is inclusion, 
and diversity, then you have to make another choice. And we talked about a couple of different ways one could make uh, another choice, and we struggled with coming up with anything that would actually be, um, that would make sense. Uh, and I think Nora said this happened in her own school district, mm -hmm. not semi rural but you were saying. Oh, Hillsborough County, the yeah. ninth largest school district in the country, this actually happened. So I don't remember what actually, honestly, I didn't follow the news afterwards, I didn't, but there was, I know one of the school members, the school members was not reelected because people were really mad at her. So, I mean, she lost her, you know, her um, position. So she went, wow. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, this is not uncommon. This is a set of questions. Um, and New York just um, voted recently in New York City to include the, um, the E politics, mm -hmm. which is also not without controversy. Okay, uh, anyone else want to comment on this one? Keep talking. I, I wonder if the people making these things are actually informed about the nuances of religion. And maybe it's just that the people making these decisions need to have the opportunity to write this stuff. Yeah, they, they, they didn't. But again, nobody, very few people do. I mean, I think this is the, the fundamental framework that, I, that does not surprise you. Uh, it's, it's rare that people will have a sophisticated understanding of religion. Not because they're not intelligent, not because they're not responsible or thoughtful or caring, but they just have very, it's rare to have exposure. The most, most of the exposure people get are through the media and through the World History textbook. So you, you know, you'll, you'll learn the kind of beliefs and practices, what, what does that help you in terms of understanding what more complicated ideas. So, so this, this is my little town. I was um, completely uh, worthless in my uh, attempt to change this because they did decide to um, to, uh, to overturn that and to quote eliminate all of the holidays. My concern with this was not so much what they ended up doing, although I'm sorry they did it. When we moved there, I was really I, I paid attention to that because I was like a small rural town that does not have a typically Jewish population that celebrates on holy days. That matters to me. That means there's a celebration, there's recognition of, of value of pluralism. Um, my concern was that they, they failed to recognize the structural, embedded structural power of Protestant Christianity in the calendar already. Mm -hmm. So this notion that we're going to you know, uh, not celebrate any religious holidays, of course, is not true, because there's the, the one group that can be assured in our school calendars and most of our civic calendars to not have major conflicts are Christians. Mm -hmm. So of course, if you're Muslim or Jewish um, and you want to play football, Fridays mm -hmm. and Saturdays are major holidays or major times for those kind of sports. Mm -hmm. You're not going to have any formal activities on a Sunday morning mm -hmm. uh, in any public school. Uh, we might have practices, but they'll get people to come to that. So for me, it was more that they didn't recognize the notion that we have power here that's functioning culturally and the embedded nature of Christian Christianity. That's what I wanted them to wrestle with. The very calendar beyond politics is Christian. Right. Exactly. So that's so they didn't they just said no one, you know, not one or the other. But the, so so I lost and so so much for the power of the public intellectual <laughs> 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 Okay, so again, remember I asked you, and I'm going to ask you just to take a moment and not, um, since I'm, I do want to move through this next part relatively quickly. I asked you to think about what do you think the purpose of education should be? Uh, what is it for you in any context that you teach? But for a moment, I'm going to ask you to think what do you think the purpose of education should be for public schools, uh, K-12 schools? So just give some thought to that yourself. Uh, this is a big question, and I'm not at all giving you the time required for it. Um, but I wanted you to just get a sense of kind of what you think yourself. And I'll give you a couple minutes to just put your mind to that, and then I'll move through some assumptions I'm bringing to this, and then move into the method framework, and why I think the method framework is important given the purpose of education I'm going to be articulating for what I feel like I do when I'm so much. You need education generally, right? Yeah, so purpose of public schools, K through twelve, especially in this context. Although I think I think this question is relevant for any educational setting completely. I really do. I think any of us who are in education need to be 
asking and answering this question on, on a frequent basis because our answers probably may change. So. So 
there are many different roots in the nature of the, the aspiration of democracy that I represent, but I wanted to introduce you if you're not familiar to, with this yet. There's this beautiful and very short but powerful exchange of letters between um, Moses Saxos, who's the warden of the Hebrew congregation in Newport, Rhode Island, in 1790, uh, and George Washington. Are any of you familiar with this exchange? Isn't it just fabulous? I'm so glad you are. So for those of you who aren't, it's, it's a, it's a, this is a, one of those gems, those little gems in history. So Washington, the Constitution is just ratified. It's pretty, it's pretty ugly if you remember. It's a hard fight. Uh, Rhode Island is the last one to ratify. Washington decides in 1790 to go around to all the colonies and he starts with Rhode Island. At that time, uh, the, like would always be the case, there are dignitaries chosen by the town to greet the, the, the president, the new president of the new ratified constitution. Um, and most of Texas was chosen. So first of all, we've got Rhode Island, which has a strong Jewish population. The fact that a Jewish person was chosen to be a dignitary is itself not going to be replicated in any of the other colonies. So that's just an important point of recognition. Um, and Sexus writes this eloquent letter saying to the president, uh, we, as Jewish people, have been persecuted for millennia, and we are so proud and uh, <coughs> excited about your leadership and about this new dawn of this new um, beginning of this republic. Um, because we uh, believe, and Sexus is the one who coined the phrase, uh, to bigotry, no sanction, and to persecution, no assistance. And he looked at Washington and he said, we believe you will guide us in these high ideals that the Constitution represents. So again, aspirational. Clearly, we all know at the time we had slavery, we had, you know, we did not have universal suffrage. I mean, clearly, the aspirations were not achieved, but the aspirations are important, and I think I, I want to, us to represent them, to recognize them. Washington writes back, and he said, and he, the other part of uh, Sex's letter was something about tolerating diversity and tolerating pluralism. And this is, a, this is the key Washington phrase here, um, because he repeats the persecution, uh, to victory you know, sanction to persecution and assistance, but it's about toleration here that he represents, and I'd like to read this to you. This is just a portion of the letter. The citizens of the United States of America have a right to applaud themselves for having given to mankind examples of an enlarged and liberal policy, a policy worthy of imitation. All possess alike liberty of conscience and immunities of citizenship. It is now no more that toleration is spoken of as if it was by the indulgence of one class of people that another enjoyed the existence of their inherent natural rights. For happily, the government of the United States, which gives bigotry no sanction to persecution and assistance, requires only that they who live under its protection should demean themselves as good citizens in giving it on all their occasion, on all occasions their effectual support. You could choose any number of documents to lift up, but the, but I wanted to highlight that for the combination of we're not talking about tolerance and the issue of power there that he highlights. That's a really key key factor. And then the notion of this aspiration of maybe treating on sanction and the importance of what it means to be a citizen. So for me, public education and any education in a democracy has to always be attentive to upholding and giving the skills and habits of heart and mind what it means to actually function as a democracy. Um, I think we're in trouble now, so I don't think we're doing that. That's one of the reasons that I can look and see what's happening to the broken civic sphere that we have. And this, then I'm going to make another point here in a moment. Um, so two recent phases of democracy, because democracy itself is also contested, and I completely, I obviously know that. But I think even having conversations about what are your aspirations and why, how do you root them is a really important one. So when I talk about what do you believe the purpose of education should be, having the conversation alone is worthwhile. We may or may not agree, but the fact that we have the conversation to recognize different values that are being promoted or not is a really valuable civic enterprise that I would really love us to be promoting. So, we, starting from, I'm going to do this really fast, but so starting with the New Deal, we had what many uh, Western democracies have understood to be the welfare state and a sense of government supporting regulations aimed at ensuring the health and well-being of citizens, especially the most vulnerable, and recognizing that that 
recognize that the support of the most vulnerable is fundamental to a well-functioning democracy. It's not equal. There's still capitalism in our Western context, but there is a sense of a safety net, the welfare state, right? And Roosevelt's New Deal was representative of that. And many of Western countries, socialist democracies and um, other democracies still have that same capitalism, but with a recognition of the social, the, the welfare state. In the last, since 1980, starting with Thatcher and Reagan, uh, we have shifted value from a welfare state to a neoliberal state. And that shift has taken a long, long time to, to, to manifest. And the shift, the reason I highlight it, it matters. Because the values that are represented in a neoliberal state is about free markets running the, uh, as the fundamental uh, value to be represented. So government function to protect free markets, which are seeing themselves as a bedrock of democracy and a source of social well-being. Protection of free markets requires a strong military and then minimal regulations which are seen as hindering free market function. So the key here is the belief that free markets are the most efficient and the best source to promote the well-being of others and all. And the foundation of this is the individual, as opposed to the foundation of the welfare state being a communal one. I'm going to come back to this, but these are really important factors in understanding what's happening to us right now. And it took a long time to get there. And it was not uh, accidental that we got here. Um, and I'll talk about that in a moment, too. So now, turning to this, I'm going to whip through this. It's one that will be familiar to you, just as songs of religion. I hope that the framing of it will be useful. Uh, for those who read the article, this will be very familiar, because it's essentially the outline of, of the article that I asked you to prepare if you had time for today. So I want to say that, first of all, I'm always going to be talking about my own assumptions because I, there are not a, there's no single answer to these questions, but I want you to understand what I'm promoting. So I'm giving you four assumptions that um, guide my own work. Religion is relevant. This is obvious to us. Uh, it challenges the notion that religion lives in a private sphere that can somehow be ignored by international relations theorists, especially and political theorists. Uh, since Westphalia in the 17th century until really recently, this is why this work at the State Department was so remarkable. It's only literally in the last 20 years that the Foreign Service and International Relations Theorists have recognized that you cannot any longer ignore religion as the third rail. It's really been a long time. Um, Ryan here of, of Kennedy School's got a really great article about this, but it's really, really recent and it's still not universally shared, but, but you have to say it matters. It's not just something new. So widespread the literacy that spans the globe, not just here in the US, but work that have done in other countries, in Afghanistan, in Malaysia, in Indonesia, in South Africa, in Kenya, in uh, uh, Egypt, in, in India, um, Singapore, several places. I started to realize, working with educators, the assumptions that we have about religion are strangely parallel in a lot of these other places in terms of the way people assume and relate to religion. And I realized that it's that they definitely took their own particular turn. But what I did realize is it's one of the legacies of colonialism and the educational uh, frameworks that were promoted from Western Christian missions primarily. And the nature, again, of that Westphalia distinction between religion being something that's a private uh, enterprise and a private sphere, which is a very Protestant Christian understanding of religion, and the notion that it is uh, can live in a sphere separate from other political, social, and cultural life. So again, it takes its different form, but it is widespread, and there are some consistent strands. The consequences, there are many, but the ones I'm most concerned about are the civic consequences. And that comes out of my work as an ethicist. So I'm concerned that uh, lack of religious understanding promotes bigotry and prejudice and hinders opportunities for cooperative endeavors in local, national, and local communities. And then finally, it's possible to diminish uh, religious literacy by teaching how to understand religion less about content and more about method. And the method is what I'm going to um, speak about now briefly. So those are the four assumptions I bring to this. So the definition of religious literacy you've got there, this is what the American Academy of Religion has adopted. 
in the K-12 guidelines, and I have the privilege of chairing the task force for them. Um, I also want to say I'm currently on another task force of where we're working on, uh, it's an Arthur Brian Davis funded American Academy of Religion uh, project, and we're creating guidelines for what all two and four year college graduates should know about religion. Uh, in any discipline, not religious studies. And that's a, that is really interesting. <laughs> Let me tell you. Anyway, and, I, and some of what, we, what this is is what we're promoting. But I, I can talk more about that if you're interested. Um, but I mean, it's a really, I'm sharing it with Gene Gallagher, who's remarkable. Do you know Gene? Yeah. yeah he's a remarkable teacher. Um, recently retired, but not retired at all. I'm just going to think about it. Uh, so I'm going to review this quickly, but so religious literacy is not, I, I, I think I want to just say what it's not. There's a, there's a lot of people using the language of religious literacy now, which is, which is interesting in one way and somewhat frustrating in another. It's not about what any other four noble truths of Bible is in the so I just want to say that's not the literacy I'm talking about here. So it entails the ability to discern and analyze the fundamental intersections of religion and social, political, cultural life through multiple lenses. Specifically, uh, a religiously literate person will know the base, a basic understanding of the history of central text where applicable. Again, we've got a monolithic, monotheistic, Christian-based way that we think about religion, right? Uh, that presumes a framework for religion itself, which is, as you know, constructed. The religious studies themselves are constructed. Uh, police practices and contemporary manifestations of several of the world's religious traditions, and this is, the italics is the key here, as they arose out of and continue to be shaped by particular social, historical, and cultural contexts. Uh, and then finally, the ability to discern and explore the religious dimensions of political, social, and cultural expressions across time and place. So it's a way to understand religion. We are not, and we're not doing it in either, we didn't do it in the guidelines for K-12, and we're not doing it with uh, uh, two and four year college graduates. We are not defining religion. Because that's a yeah. black hole, right? Because <laughs> you, you can't define religion to a general audience because you're, if you're going to do it in a scholarly appropriate way, it's, it's a fiction. And that's, that's such a distraction for what people need to know. So we're not defining it, but we are defining what it means to be literate about religion. And it's a way to understand religion. So with that definition, which again, I think is not surprising to you, um, here's, here are the four things that we some version of this is coming out for both the two and four year guidelines and it's also in the K-12 guidelines. When I am teaching people or introducing people to religion, if nothing else, I want them to, to know these four things um, because they're, they counter commonly held deeply embedded assumptions about religion. So the first is there's a distinction between, and this would lead to our first case study, a devotional assertion of religion and the study of diverse devotional search, which is the study of annual study of religion. You can, this is a truism in one way, but we conflate them all the time. And one of the ways we conflate them in public discourse and in schools <coughs> is that we invite the local imam or the local rabbi or the local priest to, tell, to, to teach about their tradition. Um, sometimes they will also be trained in the academic study of religion, but their training as religious leaders, of course, does not train them in the study of their tradition. It trains them in a particular theological assertion of their tradition. So you know that, but we don't know that more publicly. And we tend to associate more credible teaching about these traditions with people who actually practice them, and that's a real problem. So as academics, we have to help people not demean the power of what it means to be a devotional assertion to someone. I mean, that's what we're studying. We're studying the incredible, with an empathetic understanding, the incredible power of religion. But it's different to say the credibility of an academic, or the accurate representation of religion is not through the lens of believers by virtue of academic That's something that most people don't understand or know. So naming it is key. Naming it in any classroom where religion is about ready to be taught got to be a really, I would say I start anytime I'm teaching anybody about religion, even my graduate students, I always start with these four assertions because we don't know who's in the class, we don't know what their assumptions are about religion. Have you had experience 
teaching that to high school students? Yes, absolutely. Like, and that, that was successful? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. I've got, uh, there's another article I can reference for you to read that's a, also a short version of my book. I've got a book on this. I teach, this is how I teach secondary school teach, uh, students. Oh, sorry to interrupt, but uh, what about the day after with the parents? Would they uh, come back and say, you know, you're teaching my child to? This is why I, it's really critical for, especially if you're going to do it in public schools or K-12 schools. But I would say, again, just as a good practice, you all have to know what you're doing and why you're doing it. And you need to be able to explain why this study of religion has the credibility of those parents to students. I just think we need to be really transparent with everybody about what we're doing, and this becomes one of the ways to do that. And so, yeah, you should be able to say this to parents and, and administrators. Which one of you is going to be an administrator? Which one of yeah. Okay, there you go. Yeah, this you should really know, okay? <laughs> All right, so second point is religions are internally diverse. Again, a truism, but not we, ne we don't practice it. We don't embody it. So it's not just there's Sunnis and Shias. Uh, or there's Methodists and there's Quakers. Uh, it's about the internal diversity of even a given family that believes a particular, uh, or a given community, because again, religions are living traditions. The reason this is, needs to be said is because we teach the formal truths, the five pillars, the ten commandments. We teach them as though they're uniformly and historical. Third, religions evolve and change. Um, this, again, it's not uncontroversial from some theological assertions, but the point is, is if you've made a distinction already to say there's a difference between a devotional belief and study of diverse devotional beliefs, this is, um, you can't dispute the fact that different interpretations over time change the nature of how people believe religion. So, example that I give, um, and I wrote in, my, in the article, so uh, for those of you who had a chance to read it, you'll this will be from there. Um, the Southern Baptist Convention is known widely uh, for being uh, against abortion and one of the leading moral voices against abortion in the United States, and they have been for the last 10 years uh, or more, more than 10 years actually. Um, very few people know that in the 1970s, right before Roe v. Wade and right after Roe v. Wade, the Southern Baptist Convention passed resolutions affirming the moral legitimacy of abortion. Uh, in case of rape and incest, in case of the health and uh, mental and physical health of the mother, in case of the economic conditions of the family. Um, and, and then they reaffirmed that uh, in another slightly less robust uh, resolution a couple of years after Roe v. Wade, and then another into the 1980s, basically saying that they affirmed the middle ground between abortion as murder and uh, abortion as birth. And they're saying this, these are legitimate challenges. Then in 2003, the Southern Baptists reversed all those earlier ones in a resolution saying we're now reversing all the earlier ones and now we're staying this one and this is the one that we're staying with now. So again, whatever you think about abortion, the question is what happened? What's going on in that community? And that's, the, that's a fascinating, critical question. Now we're looking at questions of power. What group was in ascendancy during the 1970s, and what were the theological foundations for the beliefs that they held deeply and that the Southern Baptist Convention passed? And then what happened? What were the dynamics? That's what's interesting about the study of religion, uh, the power of a moment or a power of a, of a group to understand that. So internal diversity and the evolution of change is, again, a fundamental assertion. And then finally, religious ideologies are embedded in all dimensions experience. This, again, is not news to religious studies scholars, but because we've got that long history of Westphalia and the interpretation of religion given living in this, you know, isolated sphere uh, that continues to get reproduced, this is this is news to people. Um, and that's, that's key. So now I'm going to talk, I'm going to move into, yeah, I'm sorry. I have a question on the four points, which is how do you think those points address uh, the prejudice that religion is backwards. Is backwards. Yeah. Because you, you can say the nuances, yeah, things change, but a secular person would say, but you're just, you're still tied to a thing that is backwards. That's right? you're not completely backwards, backwards and so. irrelevant, and you're naive at best, or you're stupid to believe it, right? Yeah. So this is why this fourth point, the religion is embedded, is what I want to give you some language to be able to respond to the new atheists. 
for it, who are telling you anymore. <laughs> 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 okay. So let me move into this and then come back if you still have that question at the end of this. So I'm going to now look at this issue of embedded, because that's the more challenging one. That's the one that's not a truism. People will kind of be confused about what that means and what does it mean to talk about that. But I think it's the actual the heart of this work. Uh, the other things are about unlearning assumptions. People think if you're a believer, you're the most important person I need to talk to to learn about the religion. People think that religions are, uh, this, you know, that we can make a claim, a credible claim to say Christians believe or Muslims believe. And I basically, at the end of any time I'm teaching this to intro students, I say, I hope that every time someone will make that claim, that bells and whistles will go off in your mind. Right? So as a Christian, I can say the only thing uh, that you can say that all Christians do, or all things about Christianity, is that Christians have to deal with Jesus. They do. But how you deal with Jesus is incredibly diverse and really interesting. And the other side of it, it's really interesting to do this. So this piece now, I want to talk about the embeddedness. And I'm going to use it through a vehicle of talking about Yohan Bapa. So it's not the only way to think about embeddedness, but it's a vehicle to do so. So first of all, this is, how many of you are familiar with Paulo Freire? Okay, great, several of you. I'm so glad, because he's key to my own thinking and also I think uh, brilliant um, educator. So he makes this claim, never in the history of humanity has violence been initiated by the oppressed. So, on first glance, how many of you agree with this quote? Raise your hand. Is it the full book? <laughs> I love the book so much. <laughs> yeah. It's not a new book. Well, I mean, pretty much it's a book. Okay. So the rest of you have to vote. It's a really true point. You cannot not vote. I mean, someone's freedom fighter or someone else's terrorist, it's. Uh, okay. So it's just, it's just okay. basically saying, yeah, so it's like a matter of definition and we can't make a claim because we don't want to fair to I agree with the claim. I think it's embedded in the language of the claim. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Right? If it's somebody who is oppressed, then that already implies having right. a mouth. So I'm going to rely on the word initiate. Yeah, right. that's right. the right. 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 Oppress and initiate is exactly right. the key here. Yeah. And that has to do with the with Galton, which I want to review now quickly. For those of you, again, who read it, you'll know. this. The reason this is important is because it gives voice to structural forms of violence that we don't often see. That's the key. So let me just, again, again for those who um, did not read this at all, I want to give you, got, you've got a basic outline here of this. So Jan Galton is a peace theorist. He's a Norwegian mathematician, actually. He's still alive. He's in his 80s. Um, but he started uh, to engage in what is peace activism. And he um, comes out of the Marxist tradition, so he's coming out of that um, you know, Frankfurt School. Uh, and he is highlighting dimensions of Marx, but giving kind of important new voice. So it's not that he's completely unique in his scholarship, but his voice frames things in, in I think, a really helpful way. So rather than, so the, the, the key for him is that he, I've heard, of, I've never seen him write about this, but I've heard him speak about this. He has an optimistic view of human nature, as do I. And, here we are in the Midwest, and I'm from the Midwest, so maybe that's because I'm, I, I, you know, I grew up in Michigan, so people in Michigan are pretty optimistic, mostly. Um, and so any of us who have a relatively optimistic view of human nature have to wrestle with this question, what is, why can't we learn from our historical experiences? Why can't we, um, following the Holocaust, why, why was never again a pretty empty, Phrase. Uh, we have to, to confront it because it's a real question. Um, and so he confronted that. And he felt like, for him, his answer to that question is essentially what he's constructed here. Um, that he believes in the end that some 90, 90 to 95% of the violence that we perpetuate against one another, we do so unwittingly. And I'll talk about what, how he comes to that. 
The framework that he promotes, instead of talking about violence as only direct violence, which is what we tend to think of when we talk about violence, he's breaking it up into three points of violence. So direct violence is the most obvious here. Um, behaviors that serve to threaten life and diminish one's capacity to meet basic human needs. War, killing, maiming, bullying, sexual assault, emotional manipulation. This is what we usually associate with violence. Uh, he then has a second and third category of violence. Structural violence represents the systemic ways in which some groups are hindered from equal access to opportunities, goods, and services that enable the fulfillment of basic human needs. These can be formal as in legal structures that enforce marginalization, apartheid in South Africa, or just poor laws here in the US, or they could be culturally functional without legal mandate. Um, limited access to education, limited access to health care, um, limited access to the experience of marginalized groups, period. Uh, so structural violence for him is key. And then the key, the real part for him is what he calls cultural violence. And cultural violence represents the existence of prevailing or prominent social norms that make direct and structural violence natural, to see natural, right, or good. This is the heart of his argument. And it's cultural violence that is both the optimism as well as the sobering linchpin, really, for him as to why we continue to reproduce these forms of violence. So let's go back briefly to our uh, founding father document, the, the Washington uh, census that I wanted to uh, highlight. So we have the, the choice as contemporaries here in the 21st century to look back on slavery, for example, and we can look back and we say, what kind of awful human beings were they that could actually own human beings and own slaves? Uh, or we can look back at the Nazis and we can say, what kind of heinous human beings were they that um, literally engaged in the extermination of, of, of their neighbors and a whole population of people? Dalton says we do that a lot. We have that kind of uh, historical hindsight uh, arrogance. We can say, those people, what, what we're really saying when we ask that question is we're saying, boy, they're not like us. But he says, what if they actually are exactly like us? Because he says they are just like us. They loved their children. They um, went to. They they took pride in their religious beliefs. They loved their families. They um, played games. They had aspirations. So if they're just like us, and they had those beliefs and understandings, what was happening culturally that gave credibility? To slavery, and that's the that's the key question. And there was a lot. So religion, of course, played a really important cultural role to give more legitimacy to slavery. We know this from Protestant Christianity and the, the defense of, of slavery and the Bible text-based defenses of slavery, uh, and even the moral good of slavery. But it's not just religion; it's also uh, science, phrenology, the study of skull sizes and the way that this was a legitimate science at the time. This is, this is our friends now to our uh, scientists, uh, our, our um, challenge, people who challenge the legitimacy of religion. Science has a long history, too, of being on the wrong side of things, because it's also a cultural construct. So phrenology is the, the shape of the bumps on your head and the skull size. And it won't surprise you that those with European skull sizes and shapes or deemed to be the most civilized and intelligent, and those with African uh, skull sizes and shapes were deemed to be the least capable of intelligence and civilization, uh, primitive, in fact, and then everything in between. So this hierarchy of taxonomies. Um, eugenics, of course, we you know, also was another science that even was required course in all academic colleges until the 1930s here in the US. Um, so we've got all these embedded cultural values that are giving legitimacy to the institution of slavery that allowed people to unwittingly reproduce those beliefs without critical reflection. And we know, of course, that the abolition movement emerges out of who knows where, out of, out of religion in many ways, uh, a small minority of people who over time started to become a more majority of people who said this is wrong from their religious conviction. And scientists too started to challenge the legitimacy of these beliefs. So the cultural shifts are about human 
freedom and human choice and human critical expression of thinking. So for Galton, the reproduction of these is the unwitting acceptance of reproduction of assumptions that are embedded that end up uh, indicting us all in the participation of giving legitimacy to these claims. And so for Galton, the question is not what kind of bad people were they, but what was going on that gave that credibility. He wants us to study the people who said no to that, because that's interesting. But his most important question is, what are people going to say about us in 50 or 100 years when they look back and say, what kind of humble people were they that gave rise to whatever it is or gave legitimacy to whatever it is? And that's a really important and interesting question. So for me, the reason religion is such an important entry point to this much larger question and has more to do with a lot of things beyond religion is that because religion is so powerful a force, and such a misunderstood force that when you look at religion from the lens of cultural violence as well as cultural peace, because for Galton it's both, it's not just violence, there's the, the uh, corollary of cultural violence, cultural peace, direct peace, structural peace. Religion has the power and is always, has always been a powerful force that promotes every full range of human expression and religion. So the reason, back to our first thing, why I think it's so problematic to only assert that religion is a powerful or positive force is we're not giving people language to recognize the incredible danger that religion can and does promote. But it also, it's not one or the other, but that's what we want to do. We want to say either religion is positive or religion is negative. And both of those are just the same, the same specious argument. Religion, of course, is not either one, but it is a powerful force. A better understanding of that powerful force through this lens of cultural violence and peace can give us a recognition not only of why religions are embedded in ways that it gets embedded, but if you ask the religion question, you will always have an answer. Just like if you ask the gender question for a given social historical moment, or the race question, or an ethnicity or class question. If you ask for that lens, you'll see powerful forces functioning explicitly or, or uh, implicitly to shape a cultural norm that often is uh, is invisible to people until you start to ask to make it visible. So it's not about promoting a particular ideological conviction in any of these historical moments as educators, but it is to invite people to be conscious of what are the embedded assumptions that are currently functioning and then to interrogate those assumptions. It's not to say that if you uncover them, they're all bad. They're not all bad but to interrogate them and make more conscious decisions about embracing them, which is back to the assertion of the importance of helping people be conscious moral agents. That's what I think is a really critical role for us. So let me, let me do a couple more things here. Um, and then I want to see what you think about it. I, I'm, well, I'm not going to ask you to do this. Uh, because I want to, I want to get out, I could go a little further, but this is a really interesting exercise. Um, so just if you, if we had more time, to ask you to engage in uh, talking about when the suffrage is another um, example, like how do you use Dalton's, like how does direct structural and cultural balance function together to understand how we both allow for the fact that uh, women were not allowed to vote, what gave credibility to that, and then also what shifted it. Uh, a really interesting question is this language of political correctness, how, it, how it's been used and undermines the credibility of, uh, I would say, the structural violence. And then, and then another example. But here's, here's one. So I want to ask you this. So in context of this, you know, in the Black Lives Matter movement, we have this response, all lives matter. Now, this is a really interesting one, because it's like, who's going to argue that all lives matter, right? Of course all lives matter. All lives matter. Of course they all lives matter. So, but is all lives matter an expression of cultural violence or cultural peace? What? It's only, it's only enunciated as a, as a response or as a repudiation of something else. What, it, what's the, what happens when we say, we've got someone saying black lives matter, and then you have someone saying all lives matter. 
what's happening in that in that response? You're right. What's getting, what's not being recognized? Power symmetry. Yeah, structural violence. All lives matter erases structural violence. Conscious of, it erases the consciousness of structural violence. Erasing consciousness of structural violence happens all the time, and that itself is a profound challenge to anything that would come close to uh, approximating justice or a functional, healthy, pluralist democracy. Because especially here in the US, we are inundated with a cultural narrative of pull yourself up by the bootstraps, everybody has, all you have to do in America, you can make it, all you have to do is what? Work hard. Work hard. <laughs> That's right. I mean, we can, we've got these narratives, right? Keep your head down. Exactly. It's, if you work hard, uh, you can you can make it. So what happens then? Why aren't people making it in that narrative? Because they're not working, not working hard. hard. So we have no language for structural violence or inequity. We have no language for it in our narrative, our cultural narratives, which is why back to the Washington letter, it's so important. The thing that's most important is not the bigotry, no sanction, and persecution, no assistance, although that's important too. But it's the comment about tolerance. That's a powerful, because that talks about power in relationship to those aspirations. And if we don't have a narrative about power, then of course what's going to happen when someone says, gets mad about structural injustice, it's going to look like it's just one person against the other, and it's going to be a false equivalent. And that's what we have now. We are inundated now with false equivalent. So an expression of cultural peace is likewise matter. So direct peace. Direct peace represents the behaviors that serve to preserve life, promote human flourishing. Examples include active expressions of respect, kindness, compassion, empathy, healing, generosity, humility, I would say education except not all forms of education, which I'll turn to in a moment. Structural peace, systemic ways in which all groups have equal access to opportunities, goods, and services that enable the fulfillment of basic human needs. Legal structures that enforce equity, uh, from action, culturally functional, but without legal mandate, equal access to quality education and quality health care. It's cultural peace, represents the existence of prevailing or prominent social norms that make direct and structural peace seem natural or right or good. Examples include religious beliefs that promote justice and peaceful coexistence as well as aspirations about our democracy. So here we are. If you remember, I asked you what's what the purpose of education. And I want to give you a quick, I'm going to move on. Uh, I'm, I'm, going to, I'm, going to, I'm going to turn to prayer in a moment, and that's at the back. But I want to um, highlight this uh, statement of values uh, in a school that, I don't want to name the schools, but it's, it, it's, not, it, it's, it's itself a school, but it's there, it could be any number of schools that have similar kind of language. But this is a statement, this is their mission statement. Um, this public school community, a leader in educational excellence, guides each student to realize his or her highest potential by balancing academic achievement with personal well-being and the pursuit of individual dreams. The students engage in learning how to access and apply knowledge, think critically, creatively, and communicate effectively. They continue to develop the confidence and ability to collaborate, contribute, and adapt in an ever-changing world. What the locus of that value statement for this public school? It's the individual. Individual student's achievement. Which mirrors perfectly on the neoliberal framework of individual uh, opportunity, quantifiable measurements of value. We've got standardized tests now that are high stakes. We've got a whole industry that measures the capacity for students to achieve through uh, quantifiable measurements that were not in place. 40 years ago. There were quantifiable measurements with the high stakes in nature of those. So the reason I wanted to highlight this back with uh, neoliberalism is that then what happened in this particular community, there were hate crimes that were not unusual following uh, the election of Donald Trump. 
and there were two different hate crimes that happened. Uh, this is a community of about 5,000 people. They have a beloved uh, town center, and they're in the town center there's a rock that seniors get to paint. And the rock's always about a whole host of things, celebrating all kinds of things. But senior, it's like a senior right of passage that the seniors get to decide how this rock is going to be painted. Uh, following the election, the rock was defaced with Nazi symbols, um, uh, clitorises, and uh, pro-Trump sign. Um, and the town was incredibly upset about this because it's a relatively short, it's a close knit town, not very many people. Public schools are really celebrated. Um, there's only three schools, there's only two schools, there's the elementary school and the high school. Another incident happened though that uh, was among two um, peers on the soccer team, um, ninth graders, boys. And one ninth grade boy created a video of his um, peer on the soccer team, who was one of the few um, boys of color in the school, and he looks Muslim. He's from South Asia. He's not actually Muslim, but he looks Muslim. Uh, and he created this video with the burning towers in the background and the music from, um, kind of ominous music from some popular film that represents the beheading of, uh, or, or Bin Laden, I guess capturing Bin Laden. Uh, and then he juxtaposed the image of this boy in front of that, and he sent it around to a bunch of friends. Uh, and then one of the friends finally sent it to the boy who was the victim of this, who was, of course, devastated by this. The, uh, for a host of reasons, partly because of the value statement and because of the, the um, blue book rules, um, the school wouldn't really tie in relation to what they could do about this. But I will say that what ended up happening is that they had this statement. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. I, this, this was not useful. Uh, I, I, I do. The public, this is the statement I was going to read because the other has diversity of the still but the individual. Uh, individual excellence guides the student its highest potential, balancing academic achievement, personal well being. And then after this inc these incidents, the public school values respect and diversity in our school community. One of our core values is to create and maintain a safe and inclusive environment for students, faculty, and staff that values diversity. Recently, our school district experienced some racially divisive incidents. This is the rock and the um, individual thing that happened to the student. We take all these incidents very seriously. The police were immediately involved, families brought in, consequences were given, counseling was provided, diversity professionals were brought in. We do not and will not tolerate harassment or any other conduct that's antithetical to the values of our school community. Looking forward, we'll continue to engage diversity professionals to work with our school community while creating opportunities for families and students to engage in activities and conversations to learn inclusivity. There's work to be done in both our community across the country to eliminate racism and intolerance, and we are committed to that challenge. The difference between their mission statement and this statement of diversity is really, I think, really quite stark because they didn't include in their mission statement anything about the, the, the kind of capacity to develop the flows and the diversity in a healthy way that they assume exists. And that's what I mean about what's, we've got a shift now. We do, every, everyone thinks diversity that is valuable. We of course value diversity. We of course value pluralism. We of course value religious freedom, toleration. But we've shifted significantly from any form of discourse that promotes that explicitly, and it won't happen by accident. And we have shifted to a more individualized foundation in our schools, in our communities. Globalization itself is predicated on these ideas. Um, and so we, we have we've got no explicit intention of the recognition of structural violence that creates these terrible challenges. And now then we have just examples where this becomes two kids uh, with free speech rights, which is what ended up happening. They couldn't publicize this. The parents were threatening to sue because of privacy rights around minority or, um, um, minors. The school itself couldn't um, 
expel the student because they didn't have anything in their blue book that would give them that right. Uh, they didn't. They said they were going to, and they didn't even talk to the teachers about what had happened. And they were, I think, anxious too about the litigation. So this boy who was the victim of this, his, he was a straight A student, and his grades plummeted. The teachers had no idea what was going on. Um, and this family still lives in torment because there's still now just rumors about what's happened, but not any direct action. Uh, and the, the question is, what's the foundation going to be for this community to address this in a form that's you know, sympathetic or supportive of learning opportunity for this ninth grade boy who is the perpetuator of this, but also obviously the victim. So thanks for letting me take us full circle, but does the full circle make sense? Mm -hmm. So the reason I wanted to highlight this question of what is the purpose of education because if we're not valuing education in any context as a communal exercise of accountability and responsibility to a larger demos, we're, we created what we have now, which is, a, 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 I think, a broken demo. Uh, and what it's going to take to repair it is, I think, a long haul. But I think people care about the, I think people do care about these issues of diversity. But if we don't have language to understand in a constructive way to address structural violence, which we really do try to avoid here at all costs in the United States, where, except in our schools and in our communities where we invite these kind of conversations, are we going to be able to create those contexts? So one other quick comment, and then I want to open this up for your responses. The reason I gave you Frere in the back here is that his whole, he's an educational theorist, was, um, he worked with illiterate peasants in Brazil um, in the 1960s and 70s. Um, and when he was working with those peasants, illiterate peasants, he wasn't, he wasn't drilling them in Portuguese. He was inviting their consideration of what were the structures, what were the conditions that created their poverty. Um, and he invited a conversation about the nature of their existence uh, to help identify and engage in critical reflection and critical thinking. And out of that experience, he wrote this really critical book called Pedagogy of the Press, which he's written several books, uh, but this is the most um, seminal for him. And in that, he distinguishes between two kinds of pedagogy banking models of education where the teacher knows everything and the students know nothing or little, and that it's about content deposit. You, it's content driven. You have information, you give them information, they respond to that information through, um, I'm going to use caricatures here, but you know, through tests and multiple choice responses. Lots of our education system historically has teetered on this edge, but we've had other times during Dewey, for example, and democratic education that would promote a different kind of education. And for Prairie, the different kind is called problem-posing education. And the dimensions of problem-posing education are that students have something to teach as well as to learn. Teachers have something to learn from them. It's not saying teachers and students are the same. Sometimes he's misunderstood to say that. But he's saying essentially that we are, that if we're going to be educators, that are going to not reproduce. What happens in banking, aside from the fact that it's just knowledge regurgitation, it reinforces the status quo. It reinforces power dynamics and hierarchies. It doesn't give students language to think critically or ask critical questions about what it is they're learning. So it reinforces a dynamic of passivity that doesn't promote the opportunity for critical reflection and learning in the context. And that, for him, is the real key, is that education of all kinds should foster critical and creative thinking. Not just to be uh, belligerent. It's not about belligerence. It's about asking the questions behind the questions. And it's also about making education meaningful. So asking questions that are open-ended, problem-posing questions that are about real-world issues that students have a stake in. And I can't imagine a more important time right now in our recent history that we don't have 
critical opportunities for all of us <coughs> to join together, to put our heads together to figure out what's going on and what can we do about it to have a more positive turn of opportunities not only for our civic discourse but also for what I think people still care about, patriotism and ideals of democracy that they really are the heart of the best of what we can be as a pluralist democracy. So for, for, I wanted to introduce you to Prairie because it's how we teach, not just what we teach, but also is really critical. And I think he's been a real inspiration for me and I just wanted to introduce you to him if you can't Okay, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> textured uh, presentations and materials were essentially out of time um, for conversation. But, so I don't, you know, anyone who, who needs to go should, should absolutely go. If, if, if there are questions or comments or ideas that, that gender, are generated from this, I think we can, we can take a few minutes, um, raise some of that, um, and, um, and then allow it to, to percolate. I'm a very question of related to the one I'm talking about before, and, uh, and I can answer it. I just, I just want to bring it up and, and see if we can explore it a little bit further. It's about when you are teaching in this sort of environment, you are already constrained by school rules, and and, and, uh, yeah. and of course the expectation of parents, which is the one I, I, um, I, I uh, asked. Earlier, in our context, if, even if we went to, uh, you know, a, a college setting, university and level of education, some institutions have value statements that like that, yeah. that new faculty has to sign, yeah. uh, and, and something in the um, because of certain uh, certain problems that we have seen, you know, uh, uh, I guess like in college, for example. Yeah. Uh, so it's. Um, how how can you push uh, critical thinking? There's a definite tension I see there with pushing critical thinking the way that Plato wants to do it, and uh, I'm also responding to the community, to the school, to your peers. Yeah. You still have to have peers within the faculty. Um, how, how do you manage that? I mean, it's somehow it's certainly scary uh, in the sense that you also you need to work. So I mean, you need to feed your family. So how 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 do how do you deal with that? Uh, uh, for, for I'm looking, I'm looking for how to say it here. Yeah. No, I appreciate. I think I think for me the, the power of this and why I think I started by asking you to think about what your own understanding of the purpose of education is or should be is that I think if we invite those questions to a community, community and that you you can not only articulate what you believe and what you're trying to do, and be really clear with students. Be overt. Be overt, be explicit and transparent. And then and then it's a conversation, right? Um, and, and students, and, I mean, teachers in schools, K-12 schools are incredibly constrained now. It is one of the hardest times to be a public school educator because of the constraints around standardized tests and the incredible, incredible layers of bureaucracy that have been added in the last 10 years. However, there are incredible teachers out there. We need teachers to be in those schools to not to, ex to respond to those constraints, but also not be defined by them. And, and that's the incredible intellectual power of teaching and the challenge of teaching. It is the most challenging intellectual work to do is to translate these kind of questions that have also to translate in, a, in an inviting and invitational way and not in an imposing way. Um, you have to be able to give, you have to be able to convince people that this, that this is worthwhile. And I think that, I think the, the, the success of our democracy actually is a pretty good uh, foundation. But we're not having those conversations. We, we're function, this, this, these two statements that I read for this community, we function as though part of what we're doing in schools and in our communities is to value pluralism. That's a function that I think we all think we're doing that, we care about that. But our actual practice is not that. And that's where I think if we just show that discrepancy, people care. 
Because no matter what you believe politically, people do not like the kind of rancor. With, with some exception, I just want to say, I didn't say this, but I think it goes up. It's obvious. There's a, there are people intentionally trying to manipulate these debates. There's no question about it. So I'm not trying to, and now you would all to say that, they're, that this is all about unwitting reproduction. But he's saying that the people who are manipulating it are manipulating people who are unwittingly otherwise reproducing. And so he's not interested and I'm not interested. I don't really want to have a conversation with President Trump, frankly, or supposed to be anything. I'm not interested in those in them. I'm interested in people who are being motivated and moved by by their assertions. And I want to understand what's going on. Yes. I'm trying to think about how to apply this all to something outside of the structure of democracy or, or nationalism. Yeah, nationalism makes me cheap and stressed. And um, I think part of the problem I've understood secondary education in particular to have is that it's about disciplining the citizens in a way that I don't think fits with the model that you have. So rather than the aspirational goals, it's much more about become a good laborer, learn to sit, learn to be quiet, learn to follow rules. I think that. Yep. Yeah. And so I don't mean to say that that's always or even the most explicit goal, but I think it often is one that tends to be tied, I think, to a sense of, you know, uh, the negative aspects of nationalism. And so I'm willing to think a little bit more about your, I think I really like how you worded it, you know, aspiration, aspirational democracy or aspirations of democracy. But let's say that I can't get past the, the issue of us governmental structure. Do you think this is a model that could be applied also to other more um, flexible notions of community or ones that don't necessarily use language of things like citizenship, for instance? Even though I know we can understand that more broadly than just the national structure, but yeah. okay. I do, and it does make sense. I think it's a really good question. I do believe that. I mean, I believe, I, I, I honestly believe, and my experience has shown us, that when we ask the deeper questions, I mean, the key is that we, if we don't ask those questions, we're operating as though we think we're on the same plane with set of the same assumptions, and we're not. So then there's clashes, there's misrepresentation. I think it's really hard, and I don't want to in any way um, present this as, as simplistic, because I think, it's, I think it's the hardest thing, actually, because we're not only asking people to be self-conscious of assumptions that they held, but we're also asking people to live in these very complicated, mucky middle grounds when we want to live in the edges of, you know, clear, clear binaries. And we want people to live in the complexity of what it means to engage in the midst of structural forms of violence with each other. Because those structures kill people. And there's a lot at stake. And so, so I, I think it absolutely is that, that we raise the question, we've got to ask the question. So I don't think, I think there are very few people who would say we want our schools to be like academies that will uh, teach our children to obey. Yeah. I, there are so few parents that would say that that's what they want. Mm -hmm. They would want their children to be able to get a good job. I think that's fair, but is that all? And what's a good job in a, um, in a in an unstable community or an unstable democracy, right? So I think that's this is this is my incredible hope that if people understand that there's a lot at stake here and that we're functioning on that unwitting reproduction of a whole host of structural forms of violence, that that the intention matters, but it's not enough. Mm -hmm. That we that people that people can be invited into that. It's going to take a lot. It takes it takes a humility. There's a Sharon Welch, anybody know her? She's actually around here. She's a loyal American. No, no, no. She's, where is she? She's uh, it's not. Where is Chicago? Where? Loyal Chicago? Yeah, I think it's either Loyal Chicago. She she's she's somewhere. Sorry, and you're <laughs> sort of here. I'm really embarrassed. It just went out of my mind. Anyway, she she was she's a mentor of mine. She's a feminist uh, ethicist. She's got this great phrase. She said, "When we're doing moral work, we have to be wholehearted and half sure." I think it's phenomenal. I love that. Wholehearted and half sure. We have things to learn, but we have to have conviction about hope and the promise. And I love that. And I think something about the cultivating a habit of mind that keep, keep especially those of us in the academy, and especially those of us in these prestigious academies, for being arrogant about what we think we know. Uh, and that's what Ferry comes into. But, but yeah.
I think I think that's what I think it's possible. I've experienced it. I believe it's possible. It's a sobering but uh, optimistic place to conclude, and conclude we must. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much for being here.